our guest tonight is one of the most talked about people in Silicon Valley, talked about in the press, talked about in Wall Street, talked about pretty much everywhere you go, especially on the Pando Daily stage. So Mark once told me that he manages like the Incredible Hulk. Is that an accurate description? You're talking about Andreessen? Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, he's kind of all or nothing. You know, I, was, I was talking to him about the other day. I'm like, Mark, you know, the thing I like about you is like, it, like it's a big part of management is confrontation. And Mark's, is he, he's completely like, he either will refuse to meet with the person ever, or he'll meet with them and he will just like unravel. Like, you know, he'll confront them on everything like in the hardest possible way possible to the, make, you know, makes people want to like burst into tears he's so hard. So he's, he's so like avoid, 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 or like wham. His yeah. image is that he's been softened. He always says, I'm Mark 2.0. Yeah, well he is, look, his original mentor was Jim Clark. And so like Jim Clark is about the most volatile guy like of all times. And, uh, and so Mark like, you know, modeled himself on that and he was a lot like that. And so he is a lot more even than he was, but it's still like, he's pretty, he, he, I mean, the, the thing that's great about him is he's so uh, emotionally intense um, for, for a person that smart, which is you usually don't find that in the same package and there's something awesome about it. What was Andreessen like the first time you met him? Uh -oh. There's so many great, he's very, really he's interesting very, He's stories. very much like the way he is today. Super smart. Uh, talks like a hundred miles an hour <laughs> and uh, very outspoken mm -hmm. uh, he's but 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 he's also I think uh, mature welcome to the stage the man the legend Mark Andreessen okay. Um, now, we should say up front that you are the largest investor in Pando Daily. Yes. So, yes. we will not pretend this is in any way a completely unconflicted conversation, but as you can see from me playing that video, I also love to give you shit. Yes, so. yes. And if, it's, if you'd like, we can just play the entire interview for both of those guys. And <laughs> then you'll be done with it. We'll, that'd, be, that'd be fine. Just watch it together. That'd be good, yes. <laughs> um, so, I know you are one of these people who really likes to live in the future and hates to talk about the past, but we are going to talk about the past just a bit, because that's what we do here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about when you moved to Silicon Valley, because you've said before that, you know, when you moved here in the mid-90s, you were kind of bummed because you felt like you'd missed everything. Yeah. Yeah, so I arrived here in January of 94, and for some people in the audience are, are, are old enough to have been here then. Um, it was dead. I mean, it was dead, 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 dead. It was amazing. Um, it was so dead that all the city governments had banded together to create a task force to figure out how to bring it back to life. And that's how you know that something is dead. Um, <laughs> is your local government is on it. Um, <laughs> it, was really, it was really something. And so basically what had happened, a couple of things that happened, a couple of interesting things that happened. So one is um, the PC boom had kind of come and gone. Right? And so Intel, uh, Microsoft, and Apple, and all these companies, and Adobe had been big hits in the 80s. Um, and then by the time the 90s rolled around, they were public and established companies, and they were off to the races. But there really weren't any new startups in PCs. It was kind of over uh, at that point. Um, and then two, uh, there had been you know, a crippling recession. Um, and you know, I, I grew up and I you know, went to graduate high school in 89 and graduated college in 93. Um, and I knew two things for a fact. When I graduated high school, I knew the Japanese were going to take over everything in technology, and I'd have to learn how to speak Japanese uh, to have a career in tech. Literally, that's what I thought. Um, and then by 93, the good news is the Japanese, Japan had blown up. Bad news is the United States had blown up right along with it. Um, giant recession. Um, and I knew that my generation were a bunch of slackers and losers and layabouts, and the American dream was dead, and we were never going to accomplish anything new ever again. I mean, people were just in a horrible mood. And then third in the valley, um, the pen computing fiasco had come and gone. And mm -hmm. so there had been this attempt, it's actually really ironic, there had been this attempt to effectively build the iPad um, <laughs> in the early 90s. And it was literally the iPad that you have today, it was just 20 years too early, um, which means it weighed you know, six pounds and it battery <laughs> last, lasted for about you know, 20 minutes and it had a steam crank on the side. Um, and so you know, Apple had the Newton and there, was, there were these companies with names like Go and EO and Grid and many others. And it was a little bit like what's just happened in clean tech, right? Which is a ton of VC money went in and none came out. Um, and it was just a consequence of literally being 20 years too early. And so that had the VCs really beaten down. Um, and so the conventional view was there's nothing, it's over, it's done, put a fork in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, good time too. And yet you yeah. moved here anyway. Were you 
enamored with Silicon Valley at all? Was it just for a job? Did you have some sense it could come back? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have any idea. I, I, I came out to get a job, mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, I grew up in Wisconsin. And like a lot of people who grew up in the Midwest, the one thing you know is you want to be by a coast. Um, <laughs> and so it's mostly a question of whether you go east, west, or south. But it's one of those <laughs> options. North is hard because um, you're already pretty far north. Um, and so um, uh, I, I, I came out for a job, and, and, and actually it wasn't until I got out here that I even heard the term venture capital. Mm -hmm. Like one of the really interesting things about then versus now is the concept of venture capital I had literally never heard of. It, it didn't permeate. I, I went to what is what was a, you know what is was and is a very well respected engineering school in, in, in Illinois, but you know there were at the time no VCs and there was no concept of venture capital. Mm -hmm. um, there was one startup which was the cautionary tale. It was the startup that was like the ghost story that you tell, you know, you tell your, your classmates, like, <laughs> don't go to a startup, it'll turn out like that one. Um, but there was no venture capital, and so I really had no idea coming here about startups or venture capital. Mm -hmm. So you just thought you would be a tech worker bee for the rest yeah. of your career? Yeah, I thought I'd get a job. Um, I, thought I'd, I, thought I'd, I, thought I'd, uh, I thought I'd get a job at work, and you know, I, was, I, was, I was thrilled. So tell us about how you met Jim Clark. So Jim, for those of you who are on the younger end, so Jim is one of the legendary founders in Silicon Valley, one of the legendary company builders. Uh, He's one he, of the only two men who's built a company that exited for north of a billion each, yeah, three yeah, of them. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, he and a handful, you know, Steve Jobs, a handful of people have done this. Um, and so, in, in, and specifically Jim, Jim, excuse me, Jim's first company was called Silicon Graphics, and Silicon Graphics um, is gone now, but in its time, and when I moved to the Valley, it was the closest comparable to what Google is today. Um, it was the place where all the smartest people in the industry went to. It was the part that everybody aspired if they were going to have a company, it was going to be like SGI. You know, it was, it was just, it was, it was the thing. In fact, it was in many of the same buildings that Google's in today, so it's been just like a direct <laughs> transplant. And in fact, a lot of SGI people now work at Google. So uh, it just goes to show, sometimes it kind of stays the same. People at the top <laughs> just change. Just trade uniforms. It, exactly, trade, trade <laughs> uniforms, trade badges. Don't trade parking spaces. Um, <laughs> And so, so at the time, it was, it was white hot. Uh, Jim had started that company in uh, 1984. Um, mm -hmm. He came out of University of Utah, where he was a computer science professor. And then he, he went to Stanford. And he basically invented modern 3D graphics. And so, and at the time, the breakthrough, at the time I, I came out, this was one of the areas of the industry that was working, was um, 3D graphics. And so in the movies, Terminator 2 and then Jurassic Park kind of hammered home the potential of what could be done with that technology. Um, and so he was a legend, but um, by that point, uh, by, by 94, he had essentially left, he had left SGI mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically decided to start company number two. Mm -hmm. um, he was still on the board, um, and so he was, you know, both, you know, prohibited and also reluctant, uh, you know, did not want to raid his first company to staff a second company, but really wanted to start a second company. Um, so he couldn't so hire he, any he, of the smartest people in the Valley. He needed what he called fresh meat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so he couldn't pull people out of SGI, so he had to go look, he literally had to go look for new people. So he just called you up one day. So he called me up. Yeah. So he called me up one day and said, you know, hi, this is Jim Clark, and you know, this was number one of the days where you actually like answered your phone, um, which was <laughs> lucky, lucky for me. Um, and so it's one of those. It very easily could have been like, you know, a radio spoof, you know, radio, you know, to talk, you know, so it could have been a joke, except nobody was going to prank me at the time. But it was Jim. Um, and then he said, you know, I want to start a company, and you know, do you want to you want to talk about it? Um, and I said, you know, sure. Uh, and he said, you know, how about we get together? I said, sure. He said, okay, 7 a.m. Sunday morning uh, at El Fornio. And I said, oh, God. <laughs> 7 a.m. <laughs> You're not an early riser. Like, I'm usually not. At that, at that point in my career, I don't think I was going to bed at 7 a.m. Um, and so I prepared for about four days in advance of incrementally going to bed earlier. <laughs> Earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier, and so I woke up at like 6:30 on Sunday morning, just completely bleary-eyed, and just was like, you know, showering with coffee, um, and uh, and went and had breakfast with Jim, um, and he sort of unspooled, you know, the, the the idea of start of starting another company, and we talked for two hours, and mm -hmm. uh, and that was the beginning. Did you know you were going to do it that day? Um, if you, if he was going to have me, I thought I was going to do it. I mean, it's, it, it would be like Larry Page like calls you up at that time. It'd be like Larry Page calls you up, or it'd be like Steve Jobs calls you up, or it'd be like Mark Zuckerberg calls you up and says, hey, company number two, how'd you like to join me? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of viewed it as an IQ test, um, mm -hmm. uh, not, that, not, not that hard to pass. What was interesting was, um, and I certainly won't name names, but there, um, it turns out I was, I was not the only person he called. Um, and in fact, at one point, we had the big group dinner. Uh, at, uh, <laughs> you did? Yeah, we did. We did. We did. No. We did. There, did we, you laugh at them? No, 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 no. Well, at the time, it was so. He, he called all these people, most of whom were, had been in the industry for longer than I had, and he called about a dozen people who he knew. And so we all got together, had dinner, and kind of round table and talking about things. And of the dozen, there were about a dozen of, of, of us, and I was the only one who said yes. 
Mm-hmm. Um, now, other people had many other reasons. You know, they had existing jobs and mortgages and all kinds of stuff. But, um, right. but yeah, I, I was ultimately the one who said yes, and Jim said, okay, let's go. Now, I remember the first time you told me that story, you remarked that, you know, that was the first time that it hit you that a lot of people think they're risk takers and like to talk about risk taking, but actually when presented with an opportunity, most people actually won't take it. Yeah. I'm curious if you think that's still the case now that we live in a country where everyone's heard of venture capital, mm-hmm. where there are things like Y Combinator and a million other accelerators that, you know, I, I bet there is an accelerator who will take you no matter how bad you are in this country at this point. Um, there's you know, seed funds, the cost of creating a company is plummeted. Do you think that's still the case or have people succeeded in making this game feel less risky at least to get started? So the good news is the concept of entrepreneurship and startups has spread tremendously. The good news is that it's happening all over the place. Um, the good news is there's lots of success stories to point to. Um, the good news is the career risk is much less than people than it used to be. I mean, there, w- there was a time in the, in the U.S. where it was a career risk to join a startup, um, and that still remains true in, in, in many other countries. Um, and so that's all the good news. Uh, you know, the, the sort of bad news, it is, you know, we do live in a little bit of a bubble in the sense of it's more true here than other places. Um, there are places where it's not necessarily true. Um, I, you know, as an, just as an example, there are top-end computer science schools in the country where I still uh, go on recruiting calls with engineers who mm-hmm. our companies are trying to hire, and I still explain to them from first principles that their choice in life is not go to work for my startup or, or uh, Microsoft, and that if they go to work for my startup and it doesn't work, that their career will be over. Like, mm-hmm. I still actually have that conversation. Wow. Um, and so, um, you know, and sometimes it's them, and then sometimes it's them proxying their parents, which is kind of the interesting <laughs> you know, side of things, filtering it back. Tell your mother. We will take care of you. It will be fine. We will get you another job. Do you ever job. want someone badly enough that you call the mother? I have not this is actually, Mark Andreessen. I have not actually had to do that yet. Um, but uh, I would. I would. I would, do, I would do anything for our companies, including that. Um, so it hasn't, completely, it hasn't completely penetrated. And then the other thing is, you know, people just, people just, you know, people get to a certain point in the career and they have, they have responsibilities and they've made commitments and they have, you know, uh, obligations. Um, and so, uh, you know, some people just won't do it. And you do get one of the things entrepreneurs go through, every entrepreneur goes through this, I think, as you start to hire more people, is you, you do get the window shoppers. And it is very frustrating um, mm-hmm. because you get the people who have been at Apple for 10 years and, you know, and they're like, boy, I'm really fired up. I really want to go to a startup. And you kind of explain everything to them. And they get this increasingly stricken look on their face. <laughs> um, and then you know, four months later, they're like, I don't think I'm leaving Apple. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's happening a lot right now. Right? More people from Apple are interviewing, but mm-hmm. very few are actually leaving um, because you know, they're so used to the, the mothership. Yeah. Um, and so I, it's still, it's still a, but I, I have, you know, some people go to startups because it's a trendy thing, but like by and large, uh, I think some people are still skittish. And frankly, that's probably a good thing. Yeah. If it was totally de-risked, I think that'd be bad. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is hard. It's hard. It's hard. That's, that's exactly right. It's, it's hard. Um, and so uh, we'll put it this way. The other side of that is um, uh, people who go to startups thinking it's going to be easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the company hits its first speed bump and then they quit and panic. Um, and that's no good either. Right. Um, and so some level of you know, rigor on the you know, sort of coming in to match, you know, boy, I'm really willing to sign up for a difficult challenge is probably a good idea. Mm-hmm. So Ben Horowitz told some pretty funny stories beyond the one we showed um, about you in the Netscape get- days. And we've all sort of heard these stories, people who've been around the valley. I didn't know you then. Were you really that bad? Yeah. <laughs> Pro- probably. I don't know. I had heard that people in the Valley who were successful tended to be yellers, and so maybe I did, you know, maybe I did a small, small, small amount of that myself. Experiment in that yeah, for a few yeah, years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, I, so look, I got really lucky. I had two kind of fundamental mentors in that phase of my career. Um, one was Jim Clark, and then the other was Jim Barstale, who became our CEO. Um, and so, and I got really lucky because what I was able to learn from Clark was, how to, you know, or what I aspired to learn from Clark was how to think about the future and how to think about new products and how to think about technology and how to paint a vision um, and how to understand the trade-offs. I always thought Jim Clark was a master of, you know, there's the technology and there's the market um, and there's the people and you got to figure out a way to kind of cross the three to do something new. Mm-hmm. And he could think about it kind of from all angles and kind of pull these ideas together figure out timing. Um, and so he's like, he's always described as one of the great conceptual artists of thinking about, of thinking about new ideas and new startups. Um, and so I learned all that, and then I got lucky, and that, uh, I, that guy, I then got I also learned from Jim Barksdale, who's one of the great um, business leaders, CEOs, operators, managers, and then also uh, very you know southern gentleman, very you know um, very calm, mm-hmm. um, very put together, very deliberate, very good at working with people, very good mm-hmm. at sweet talking people, very good at 
Um, uh, oh God, I should tell a story. Can I Do tell it. a story? Can I tell a story? I, I don't. I don't think this story's ever been told. Can I use a bad word? Of course. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't think this story's ever been told. It'll make. It'll make. Both of these guys are not going to want me to tell the story, but it's going to make them both look good. Um, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and tell the story. So it's the guiding principle of my career. So. so <laughs> So, so Jim Clark was the CEO of Netscape for about nine months, um, and was like the guy who, you know, we he helped really created, you know, created the whole thing. Um, but he always knew he didn't want to be the CEO. He wanted to have a professional professional CEO come in, and so we recruited uh, and ended up landing Jim Barksdale. He'd previously run Macaw Cellular, which was the big mobile carrier at the time, and, and then before that, Federal Express. Before that, had been an IBM, so in a very dyed in the wool uh, operator. Um, and so there was a sort of handoff period where Clark was still there, but Jim Barksdale was sitting in and observing and watching and coming up to speed. Um, and so, you know, they'd have these staff meetings where you'd have both Jims in the, in the staff meeting. And, 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 and Clark, like, like Ben says about me, Clark could, Jim, Jim Clark could occasionally get a little emotional. Um, <laughs> and so um, one time there was some issue about product was slipping or something like that, and Jim Clark, um, you know, got upset and got a little bit, you know, uh, got a little worked up. Um, passionate, um, and uh, Jim Barksdale said, you know, Jim, to Jim Clark, I said, you know, could you please, you know, let's, let's just go spend a couple minutes, you know, by ourselves outside. Um, and I found this out afterwards. Um, he, from actually both guys, uh, uh, Barksdale took Clark outside, and, and Clark was, you know, really upset, and like, you don't understand, this is really serious, and, uh, you know, we really got to do something about this, and Barksdale looked right at Clark and said, I understand, Jim, this is just as serious as dick cancer. <laughs> Clark came to a complete halt <laughs> for about 10 seconds and then just burst out laughing. <laughs> and literally laughed for like the rest of the day. It was like the funniest thing he'd ever heard. That, that is an expression in Memphis. Is, it, is that, is that? Okay. Is, no, I'm sure, it's not. I'm sure it, I'm sure it, I'm sure it, it, will it be now. I'm sure it, I'm sure it would be. I'm sure it would be. And so I will admit every once in a while in our office that one gets rolled out. Although, although, only for special occasions. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, the first time I ever interviewed you, which I think was in um, 2005 or so, I had to negotiate for a phone call with you for like six months, and the, the term, the only like writer in your contract was I could not ask you about Netscape. So since then, you've still not loved talking about Netscape. So to take a little of the burden off of you, um, we uh, prepared a short clip um, oh, good. Yeah, good. of other people talking about Netscape. We've been lucky enough to have Ben Horowitz, who was a very key executive, John Doerr, who invested, and Danny Reimer, who helped take them public. Um, so it's been one of the more, not only more iconic companies in value, but most talked about at our series. So take it away. How do you feel about Microsoft and what they did now, years later? Screw those bastards! <laughs> Tell us how you really feel about Microsoft, Ben. Well, they almost killed Netscape. Though, uh, interesting, they certainly eliminated Netscape's browser business. I mean, what Netscape represents to me was um, sort of the pioneer of the internet. Going after um, not only creating the first approach to the browser and the infrastructure to actually explore the web, but also commercialize the web. Yahoo, you know, really was built, among others, was really built on the back of Netscape. There would be no Yahoo without, without Netscape, and there would be no Google without Yahoo, and probably would be, well, we can carry on with that. Netscape was led by a three-person dream team. Crazy serial entrepreneur Jim Clark, polished and professional CEO Jim Barksdale, and a brash 20-something kid from the Midwest named Mark Andreessen. It was a powerful yet volatile cocktail. We planned this massive launch in New York City with like, you know, on stage and you know, big lights and all these things, and everybody from the press was coming and it was gonna be awesome. And two weeks before the launch, um, Mark leaks the entire strategy and the entire story to, you know, not the Wall Street Journal, not the New York Times, but computer reseller news. Uh, which was the best of the computer reseller news bar magazines, you know. But it was, you know, CRN, and the reporter was very good, and he got the whole story out of Mark, like the pricing, the, you know, all the components, it was gonna take on back office. And I was so upset, and so I sent him an email, I'm like, 
I guess we're not going to wait for the launch. <laughs> you know, that, that's just one line email. And he replies and, you know, CC Mike Homer, who was my boss, uh, Jim Barksdale, who was the CEO, and Jim Clark, <laughs> who was the uh, volatile founder. Um, and the, his email said, and I, I don't remember it exactly, but I remember a lot of it. He said, well, I guess you really don't understand what's going on. We're getting killed, 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 and losing billions of dollars in value every day because server product management, which is basically me, has no idea what they're doing. Next time, do the fucking interview yourself. Fuck you, Mark. <laughs> And I got that email on the day he was on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> Despite the turmoil, America's fascination with what the Netscape browser could unlock, a whole new world of e-commerce and information, pushed the young 18-month-old company towards a tumultuous IPO that would forever change Silicon Valley. But something else factored into the timing as well. Is it true the main reason you went public then was because Jim Clark wanted to buy a boat? Uh, that had that, that that did factor into it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the great Jim. Netscape moment we all hear about was simply because of a boat. Yeah, but to Jim's credit, it turned out to be a good idea. <laughs> but if you hold held your Netscape stock that you bought at any time, through to the acquisition by Time Warner, uh, the ultimate value of the enterprise was 14 billion dollars. So you made really good money <clears throat> in staying with it, and it was a uh, uh, you know, a seminal company it made a big difference. Was it the IPO that was iconic? Was it what it did for technology? Was it something about how it reshaped what it was to be an internet startup? What was so different about it? God, you should answer this question. It's all those things you cited. It's really <laughs> very true. This was the company, that, you know, here we are, it's, it's not even 20 years later, that took the internet from something that was used basically by physicists into something that every woman and man could use. This whole like point and click idea that the pictures would get you to all the world's information. That's a powerful paradigm shift. That's a really very big deal. When you look back even in like 50 year history of Silicon Valley, like that IPO will always be one of the most iconic things that's gotten us here. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, it was so difficult to explain the story. Like you're really, you're just talking about a browser, for God's sakes. By the way, I want to say some nice things about those two guys. So, um, <laughs> door, so door, so door. It, it's it's not it's you know it's now so obvious the internet is, is a big deal and everybody wants to use it. But as we've talked about before, like at the time, it very much was not the case. So we went out to raise venture capital in April of '94 mm -hmm. um, when I was figuring I first heard the term venture capital. Um, and um, and Jim, you know, like like a lot of great entrepreneurs, Jim would only talk to a, a few VCs, but the ones he considered were, were the best. And it was it was John on that short list, and then there were there were two others. Um, and John was the one of the group that really believed in the idea that the internet could be a big, a big that ordinary people could use the internet and that you could build a big company around it. And mm -hmm. other VCs at that time did not believe that. Um, mm -hmm. And they didn't believe that because nobody else believed it, because the press didn't believe it, because the industry didn't believe it. But John, John took a big, you know, and the, and the one, on the one hand, betting on Jim Clark is a sort of a, is a no-brainer, I think, as a VC. But on the other hand, it was a big deal to back an internet company at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Danny uh, was the analyst uh, at Hamburg and Quist, which was an investment bank at the time that was the co-underwriter on the Netscape IPO. And Danny played a key role. Danny and Mary Meeker basically explained the internet to Wall Street, <laughs> which was helpful because um, they did not, they did not, they had not wrapped their head around it when we went when we went out. So they're a big reason why the Netscape IPO actually worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he said at the end it was just a browser, and you missed some of the uh, glamour shots of yeah, Netscape, yeah, the yeah, browser yeah. that we <laughs> interspersed in the video. I mean, when you look back on what Netscape was, yeah. it, I mean, it must look primitive. Well, it does, so it's interesting. Um, it, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Netscape, it's, there's a couple of movies. Um, um, the original Mission Impossible movie and Contact, uh, the Jodie Foster uh, alien movie from that, from that time, and they both uh, used the Netscape browser in its original glorious 1.0 configuration. Um, and to this day, when I watch those movies, I'm just like, I can't believe that it looked that awful. <laughs> um, like it just looked horrible and we had this throbbing end logo that was the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen and it was it's all you know now today's by today's standard just looks blocky and primitive and crude I mean it looks like <laughs> it looks like using a steam engine or something um, and so um, yeah it did it did uh, in retrospect it does but at 
the time, it was, you know, at the time, it, I mean, even yeah. we just using it every day, we're like, you know, it's just amazing. And it was not that long ago. Yeah, I and mean, it was not that long ago. What does this make you think about, you know, where we're going to be in another 10, 15, 20 years and like how, you know, iPhones are going to look? Yeah, this is why I'm so optimistic on this industry. I'm so bullish on this industry and, 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 and on the Valley is because like the stuff we were working on, I mean, even you see these people working on stuff today, you know, you're a designer, you look at the stuff you worked on five years ago, you're just humiliated, absolutely embarrassed and shocked. You, you ever <laughs> thought that that was good? And then 10 years ago, it just looks like ancient. And then 15 years ago, it looks like Stone Age. And 20 years ago, it looks like, you know, it's just this, this, stuff, this stuff moves so fast. It just gets so much better so fast. Um, and so the, the extrapolation is the stuff that we're using today that we just think is amazing, right? And I think the iPhone and iPad and iOS and Apple TV and, and uh, Android and all these things are just breathtakingly amazing uh, things. Um, they are going to look so primitive in 10 years, mm -hmm. in 20 years compared to what we have today. It's going to just be, we're going to be shocked that we all thought that this stuff was like a good idea. Do you think it's uh, accelerating? Do you think it's decelerating? Yeah, it's mostly, I think it's accelerating. I, I think it's accelerating. I, 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 think innovation, uh, I think innovation accelerates. Innovation compounds. We all build on all the layers that came before us. Um, and so the browser got built. The browser and the web were able to get built because the internet had gotten built over the preceding 30 years. You know, they got built because the computer got built to defeat, you know, the Nazis. Um, you know, that got built because of 200 years of work that had happened in math, you know, and visionaries, you know, uh, like uh, Lady Lovelace and, you know, uh, Babbage and all these guys. Um, and so it's, it's, it's all building, and then, and then that's sort of the macro view, and the micro view, right, is you see it with open source now, right, which is every new layer of open source, um, you know, every new open protocol, every new standard, um, every new programming language, it, you, people, just, people just build on top, and, and, and it just compounds and compounds, you know, it's, like, it's the old, it's the, you know, snowball rolling down the hill, you know, turning into an avalanche. Um, and so that, that's the part that makes me just so optimistic is we, we all benefit from all the work that came before us both a year ago, right, and 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just more and more to build on all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you're very famous for an op-ed that you did in the Wall Street Journal um, called Software is Eating the World. Um, you know, you believe that computer science is just increasingly going to be taking over other industries. And yep. we've already seen this to a degree with like Uber and delivery and a lot of these like logistics, offline industries that people never thought would become sexy again. Um, what is out there that the inter that software hasn't eaten yet? Um, are there areas where you guys aren't seeing investments, but you really want to invest and you're just waiting for that right computer science guy disrupting it? Well, I think almost every industry at this point, there's really profound things you can do by applying more software. I mean, it, it, almost across the board. Um, the, the big issue, the big, the big issue is it's, it's, it's so gated by regulation, the, the big thing that we were, it's so gated by regulation, there's so much that can be done in software and healthcare, there's so much that can be done in education, there's so much that can be done in, I mean, law, <laughs> um, all, you know, someday politics, um, uh, there's just, there are so many um, things that can be done. Um, and I, I just, I think it's going to be, I think you see it today, I think there's going to be exact correlation between the level of regulation and, you know, the sort of low, you know, sort of the lower the level of regulation, the faster the move, uh, the faster the, the, the new ideas are going to be able to hit. Um, so in the, in, the, in the areas that are relatively lightly regulated, the innovation, software-based innovation is going to become very important. Mm -hmm. the media industry is obviously, you know, sort of a, a, a great example, like media industry mostly deregulated because of the First Amendment, therefore things can move just incredibly quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, healthcare and education are the really big ones, but they're the most regulated sectors of the economy, and so they're going to move the slowest. But do you think that regulation ever goes away? I mean, how, or does the software get so powerful and the need get so powerful that it breaks through it? Well, so a few things happen. I think at the micro level, regulation changes because people ultimately do, when people do see a better way of doing things, like they ultimately will move. And so you see this a lot. You see this with, you know, with, with these new things like the ride sharing, you know, Uber and Lyft. Like they're just, it's just clear as a consumer how much better the experience is. And so there's a lot of consumer, um, you know, there's a lot of consumer demand. And then the other thing is like, they're great for drivers. Like it's like, it's amazing as a driver to be able to get, you know, a lot of, a lot of drivers who drive, you know, now taxis or town cars or whatever are on Uber or Lyft taking jobs on the side or thinking about becoming independent drivers or thinking about buying a car uh, or thinking about buying a fleet of cars to be able to do this. Um, and so it's opening up new income opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, for the drivers. Um, and so at some point, um, you know, it just kind of becomes obvious. And which isn't to say there aren't debates and disputes and arguments and, you know, lobbying and all the rest. It isn't to say that regulation doesn't need to change and maybe there needs to be taxes in some cases where there aren't today, uh, but it will change. The other thing is I think more of the really sharp entrepreneurs are going to come in from, uh, I think it's the areas that are most regulated, I think they're most prone to having somebody come in completely from the outside and just start an entirely new parallel system. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm increasingly thinking that that's what's going to happen in education. Mm -hmm. um, I think software-based education is going to be a completely new system, completely alongside or separate from, largely disconnected from the status quo of certainly public education and maybe even private education. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll, it'll just be literally new ideas. And so, it's, and this is sort of the fun part of, of our industry, right? Is it's like, okay, clean sheet of paper. What if, if you knew you had all the technologies we have today? If you knew every kid had a tablet? If you knew, you know, about all the user interface models that you have in video games? And if you knew everything that you knew? about how we build what we build today, and you decided to create an education experience from scratch, right, for kids all over the world, what would that look like? You can imagine that you could build a really, really amazing experience that would have virtually nothing to do with the existing way that classrooms work and, you know, teaching and all the sort of traditional things. And I think, you know, we see more and more entrepreneurs who are willing to kind of take that approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the, those are the most radical ideas in a lot of ways. It's like, we're just, you know, we, we won't try to change the current system, we'll just leave it in place, we'll just come in on top you know, with a better way of doing it mm -hmm. comprehensively. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see more of that. So what other than education, do you think you ever see that in areas of finance? Yeah, well, you know, finance, finance has been relatively um, uh, prone to that historically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, finance is always kind of a running battle between the entrepreneurs and the regulators. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the New York Attorney General is going after the high frequency traders now, right? So there's sort of that catch ups happening there, you know, the big banks. The, you know, the interesting thing that happens, right? The big banks get regulated so, uh, with uh, you know, Dodd Frank, and then that causes more and more of the people at those places to leave and go to hedge funds, which are still largely unregulated. Then the hedge funds operate in the public markets, and now the public markets are getting more regulated, and so there's more money coming from hedge funds into private companies, you know, into, into, into private equity. Um, and then you know, at the outer edge, you've got Bitcoin, um, and you've got cryptographic currencies. Um, mm -hmm. We met with a, uh, we're spending a lot of time on, we're very, we're very optimistic on Bitcoin and we're very enthusiastic, but we're spending time with lawyers because there's all these legal issues and we met with a top securities lawyer and he said, well, he said, good news guys. He said, here you have a financial instrument that could be simultaneously regulated as a currency, uh, a commodity and a security. Um, he said, you have the perfect storm. Every single regulator uh, is going to lay claim to this. Um, he said, the bad news is that it's going to get regulated from every single uh, side, um, the, at least in the US. He said, the good news is they're going to fight over who gets to regulate it. Um, and so your job is to sneak through the fight um, uh, while they're battling it out to see who's in charge. Um, but but the, Bitcoin's a great example of this. Like Bitcoin. Bitcoin, like I think Bitcoin will ultimately be, it'll ultimately be regulated in the US, it'll ultimately be accepted, like it'll, it'll happen. But there are lots of places in the world, I mean the US for all of, its, all of our problems has a relatively healthy functioning financial system on a relative, not on an absolute basis, on a relative basis compared to a lot of other countries. Um, there are a lot of other countries in the world that have a disastrous currency system or a disastrous internal financial or regulatory system. Bitcoin is gonna be extremely attractive in those countries, right? Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is gonna be the outside response it's going to be adopted precisely because it's not controlled by the government of, you know, pick a country mm -hmm. um, that has bad policies. Um, and so it's an example of this where it'll, it'll basically, it essentially it's coming in from outside. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I really like about the ideas that come in from outside, they're risky and dangerous because in, 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 you know, they can be regulated and you have to sort of deal with these issues. You know, the exciting thing is to a certain extent, the radical new ideas, the ones that come in from outside are sort of a reaction to all of the, over-regulation, over-control that's already happening, right? So, like, so if world currencies today were, like, completely fluid um, and you could move money freely across borders um, and there were, you know, and, and, like, all these other sort of, you know, sort of libertarian kind of aspects of mm -hmm. how you think about currency, then in a sense you wouldn't need Bitcoin because you'd already have kind of just free, free flow of money. Mm -hmm. um, so one way to think about Bitcoin is it's a response to the fact that large, by and large, currencies are controlled today. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so it's a response to the control. And so, to an extent, the more people try to add more control, the more it just creates the need for the uncontrolled alternative. Right. Right. And so, it's a, it's, it's sort of a, you know, if it's a genuinely radical new idea, you know, it will tend to benefit. It, it not benefit in the moment, but in the long run, it will benefit by attempts From to quash it. From the clampdown. Yeah. Um, I think the internet was a little bit like that in the I early days. I mean, a days. bit like file sharing and music. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, so they, you know, they go after Napster and they kill that, and then Kazaa shows up, right? And it's like ten times worse because it's far harder to kill. And then they mm -hmm. figure out how to kill that, and then BitTorrent shows up, and that's a thousand times worse. Um, and then, um, and then they, they, they go after that, and then Tor shows up, which is a million times worse. <laughs> um, and then they get lucky because Daniel X shows up <laughs> with Spotify, <laughs> finally gives them the solution, and they're they're finally ready to listen. Um, right. You know, so sometimes this stuff mainstreams, but. But yeah, the, the, it's, the file sharing stuff is a perfect example. You take smart coders and you tell them they can't do something, and that is very inspiring, right? I mean, that's very, that's <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> now, obviously, you <laughs> love giving code. fuel to yeah. the said smart coders. Yeah. But when it comes to something like Bitcoin, like, you guys have been 
talking about Bitcoin, yeah. you've been interested, you've been talking to all these regulators, like, why don't you just make a bet? Yeah. You've got lots of money. So, <laughs> the challenge, yeah, and with an attitude like that, we won't for very long. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sarah Lacey, venture capitalist. Um, <laughs> That's why I just write about this shit. <laughs> so, so the major challenge, the, the challenge we have in our, the main challenge in venture capital actually turns out to be, we, we, you, you conf, conf, we haven't taken out conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we invest in a startup mm -hmm. in a given sector, um, you know, we invest in a Bitcoin exchange or something like that. Um, we can only make, we can only make one bet. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that company is actually in Pick business. Pick please. Right, what's that? Pick please. Oh yeah, exactly right. And and, and no some, Instagram for you for people yeah, who don't exactly, know the right. story. Yeah, exactly right. So so and, and it's it's the compact it's the compact between the entrepreneur and the venture capitalist um, that most venture capitalists take very seriously, which is if I if I bet on your company, I'm not going to bet on, I'm not going to also back one of your competitors, um, and I think that's that's generally widely accepted. And so you sort of have this interesting puzzle as a VC, and, an, or, and a lot of VCs I think are looking at Bitcoin like this right now, which is um, there are a whole bunch of companies that look really promising. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of startups that are kind of being incubated. People are kind of uh, uh, sort of getting to work on. And you're starting to see now, it hasn't become really public yet, but you're starting to see more really experienced, high quality, like proven entrepreneurs who are c coming after Bitcoin now. And they've got all kinds of new ideas, um, but some of them aren't ready to raise money. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> tactically, it's just navigating through and kind of trying to figure out how to place the right bets. You know, the other thing is, we would love to make a bigger, you know, a bigger bet faster. The other thing is, you know, like the internet, Bitcoin is one of those things where it's probably going to be hard. Like, it's either going to work or it's not, but if it works, it's going to work at such scale that it's going to be hard to make a venture investment too late. Like, it's going to, yeah. it, it's just the basic numbers, right? So for Bitcoin to become a big success, you know, you, you, have to, you have to think it has to be able to handle a lot of trading volume, like, in the world. And so you take, like, the global flow of goods and services and money, and you just run the numbers on how big that number is, and if you could just get Bitcoin to 1% of that, the number is astronomical, right? It's, you know, it's trillions of dollars. Um, and so there's a lot of headroom of growth from where it is today um, mm -hmm. before it kind of becomes uh, its full form. And there, just like with the internet, there will be new ideas every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're just gonna watch and work and you know, help people as much as we can and then place careful bets. Now, you and um, Peter Thiel had a really interesting debate about whether or not Silicon Valley is sort of, you know, doing enough and is out there enough and is pushing big ideas. And Peter obviously has the whole, you know, we wanted flying cars and we got Twitter, you know, manifesto. Now, in that debate, you were sort of defending Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, do you, I mean, do you really look at a lot of the things in your portfolio and look at a lot of things in the world and think that you guys are funding most of the things? Are you just so hamstrung by regulators? Is there a way that Andreessen Horowitz could, you know, stop backing more apps and throw some of the money towards like the next SpaceX? Right, right, exactly. So, um, so um, yeah, no. So when I debate with Peter, he says we wanted flying cars. We got 140 characters, so therefore I can't resist. I attack flying cars and I defend Twitter, which <laughs> <laughs> cranks him up to no end. Um, uh, so, in a sense, I very much disagree with what he says. So, in a sense, I very much disagree with what he says, and then in a sense, I very much agree with it. So, what I disagree with is I think the innovation that's happening today in Silicon Valley is very important, profound, deep, and important. Like, I think it's, I, I'm completely unapologetic about the idea. Like, I think, for example, Uber and Lyft. I think Uber and Lyft, Lyft is, you know, the company we work with, very excited about. Um, I think these companies are trans they're transformational for transportation. Like, mm -hmm. I think they're fun, and we could talk about that for a long time. I think Airbnb is transformational for real estate. I think Bitcoin, transformational for financial services. And these companies have this incredibly nice property that you can, when you can, when you can apply software, you can do it in a very cost-effective way. Software is just not very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so the capital efficiency of having a small group of software programmers who build amazing software, who then go in and do something in an industry that's a $100 billion or $1 trillion industry, like, it's existing venture capital structure and framework is very good at doing that. It works very well when it works. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very valuable. And I always accuse Peter of just dismissing all that stuff out of hand, which is probably an, an overstatement. Mm -hmm. um, the part that I agree with, or I guess the part that I struggle with, and I'm on the verge of agreeing with, is, you know, it's exactly, it's SpaceX, it's Tesla. You know, it's, so basically, right, it's the, three, the, the real, the trenchant critique comes from Larry Page, uh, Elon, and, and Peter. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, okay, software, got it. You know, what about, you know, electric cars? What about, you know, the Hyperloop? What about, uh, you know, the, what about the SpaceX uh, private rocketry? What about, 
you know, these sort of bigger, more transformational things? And in particular, what about the things that operate more in the real world, right? What about the things that are really going to affect natural resources and pollution and mm -hmm. livability of cities and all the things, you know, that are kind of outside of whatever's running, you know, on the screen? Um, and so, and, and so I think that there's a validity, I mean, you know, Google, self-driving car, Google is doing the self-driving car. The self-driving car is going to work. Mm -hmm. it, by the time it works, it will have cost hundreds of millions and possibly billions of dollars to make work, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing lightweight. It, that, the self-driving car is not a lean startup. Um, <laughs> like not in any way, right? <laughs> it is, you know, it's, it's entirely contained in Google because they have the money and the staying power and the patience to be able to fund it over years with a lot of money. Um, you know, uh, SpaceX and Tesla were not lean startups. They were very big, ambitious. Yeah. They raised a lot of money. Um, the problem, well, there's sort of two problems. One is, where do you think you can actually do this? And that gets into things like, where is it just too regulated? And those guys, all three of them, have more of an inclination to say, yeah, like, just power through the regulation. Just, like, figure out a way. Mm -hmm. Give the world a better answer and let the world adjust. Um, but kind of how do you calibrate to that um, and not blow up an enormous amount of capital? Um, and then, you know, the other question is, the venture capital funding model does run into a real, the venture capital funding model can fund really big companies. I mean, Facebook raised a very large amount of money as a private company, you know, more than most people realize. The problem with venture capital as a structure today for the bigger things is, the assumption is every new round of capital has a new lead investor, and the assumption is something has gone wrong if you don't have a new lead investor every step of the way. So, right, mm -hmm. you raise five, and then 10, and then 20, yeah, and then 40, inside and round even has inside kind of rounds stigma. Inside rounds have bad connotations, mm -hmm. and venture capital LPs have learned, historically, that inside rounds mean you're propping up bad companies. And so they don't like when you do it. Like, they don't like it. They don't like when you invest across funds. And, they get, and, and that happens in venture capital. It happens. You, you know, you, you, there are cases where you prop up companies that otherwise can't raise money. So there's sort of this, this, this tinge to it. So the big question, the question I'm noodling around is, OK, like, what about the efforts where you just have to say, this thing is going to take $300 million? It just is. Um, mm -hmm. And there's no shortcut, and there's no minimum viable product. It is going to take $300 million. And that $300 million has to be reserved ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then you need a, uh, and so the good news is you know it's going to be there. Um, the bad news is you got to think hard about how that money gets staged and deployed in. You got to think hard about what the milestones are. You know, th those companies have to be run completely differently because they have to, I mean, the, the, the stakes are so much higher. Um, and, you know, what kind of entrepreneur can do that? You know, Elon has proven he can do it. There are not a lot of other people in the Valley today who have done things at that level of scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a different kind of entrepreneur. There's a different kind of idea. There's a different kind of financing method. Mm -hmm. and I think we'll all collectively figure it out, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, we don't actually have it today. So you think that is a whole? You think that is yeah. something that... I think that is a whole. Well, venture capital, venture capital, as it's configured today, is very good at picking up science that's been developed largely with federal funding for 30 or 40 years and then doing the last two to five years of applied development to get it into a, a commercial product. Like, we're really good at that. Mm -hmm. um, we're not good, I mean, the clean tech, you know, the energy, the energy stuff, you know, largely not working kind of illustrates we're not that good at picking something up that either has not had a lot of science funding behind it um, or is gonna take five or 10 years to develop, right, as opposed to two to five years. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is kind of, can we stretch the boundaries of the scope of the projects that we can fund and support and staff um, without losing our minds, right? Right. Um, like, you know, there's the other side of this, which is arrogance, right? So, <laughs> you know, we keep, we, we have what everybody thinks is a piece of modern art in our main conference room, but it's actually a cylinder solar panel um, <laughs> <laughs> that I bought off of eBay. Uh, the weak cylinder went bankrupt uh, for 10 bucks. Um, and I've just, I've propped it up against the, uh, I guess the for cylinder, probably people are familiar with it, but. You know, they vaporized a billion and a half dollars, including taxpayer money, building mm -hmm. cylindrical solar panels. Like, there is a point of, there is a point where you stretch this stuff too far. Mm -hmm. um, and so, somewhere between, yeah, somewhere between the next photo sharing app of Solyndra, like somewhere in there, there's a sweet spot. <laughs> I just think it's, it's just not, I guess what I, and then what I argue with Peter about is this, it's not sufficient to just, or I argue with, with people who say things like, it's not sufficient to just say this is missing. It, we have to figure out how to actually do it. Right. And I, we don't yet actually have the formula yet for how to do that. And so, what you get is you have a very special entrepreneur like Elon, mm -hmm. and then he can do it. Mm -hmm. But what I always say is, okay, name the next, Who's the next Elon? Right, right. right. And then we'll, you know, then we'll talk. You know, so. Or the next Google. I mean, you bring up right. Google with self-driving cars. I mean, it begs the question, what is Google turning into? Yeah. Because that's not their only sort of wild project. So I think of them as the modern General Electric. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it, you know, GE was like a hot, you know, I'm talking about like GE in the first half of the century. I mean, they're a great company now, but 
from like 1900 to 1950, like they were a hotbed of, of, of R&D at scale, um, uh, all built around, uh, you know, electricity, electronics. Um, uh, you know, HP was that, you know, in the Valley, there was, you know, a mm -hmm. several decade period where a lot of the new yeah. products in the Valley came out of HP. Well, in Bell Labs. Bell Labs had that role. Um, and so um, I think Google, to their enormous credit, um, is that today. A lot of it is Larry, a lot of it is, you know, the rest of the team there, and then a lot of it is just the attitude and the staying power to be able to do these things, but it, it does, you know, I guarantee, you know, I guarantee it's like, you know, it's, it's, why is the self-driving car being done at Google and not as a startup funded by venture capital? Like, I think that is a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the internet and where it's going, since obviously your whole career has sort of been at the, at the birth of it and continuing of it. So, I mean, you went from Netscape, which people did not think would be viable, yeah. to, you know, then being on the board of Facebook, which has, you know, a billion users around the world, and it's like, smartphones are going to drive that even further. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you think about the companies that you will be creating and funding when that doubles, you know, in yeah. a shorter period of time, when there's yeah. 2 billion people online, when there's 3 billion people online. How do you think about that, that huge scale that it's getting to? So I think we're at about 2 billion people right now. We're on our way to 5 billion, I think, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm so confident in that is because there are already 5 billion mobile phones in the world. And I think um, the feature phones, the, the, there's around two, you know, it's going to be around 2 billion smartphones here pretty quick. And then there's going to be about another 3 billion feature phones. And these are the phones primarily in the developing world, very low price points, um, uh, you know, used by people without very much money. Um, but the smartphone revolution is now moving so fast um, that, and the volumes of smartphones are exploding so fast that I actually think that the phone makers are going to stop making feature phones. I think they'll only make smartphones. Mm -hmm. And so I think that everybody with a feature phone within three, four, five years is going to have a smartphone mm -hmm. um, or be able, to, or you'll be able to get one. And the prices are coming. The prices are going to come down really fast from here. Smartphone prices are coming way down. Um, and so um, we're going to have 5 billion smartphones, and then, I, and then that takes us 5 out of about roughly 7 billion people on the planet. And the last 2 billion are the hardest to get to, but we will, we will get there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will end up with 7 billion people online. That is probably the most important thing happening in the world right now today, which is sort of this twin kind of phenomenon of the entirety of the planet's population joining what we would view to be the, the sort of the global economy, um, the global information space, the global education space, um, you know, the ability to learn, contribute, um, you know, educate their kids, um, access information, express opinions, um, is really going to spread to everybody. Um, and that's, that's happening at the same time as the developing world is, in fact, developing. And, and as the global middle class is rising very fast and as the poverty numbers are plummeting, which is, you know, just incredibly positive development in the world. Um, and I think that there's like a feedback loop between those two things and mm -hmm. because right I think it's in part it's because people now have more access to technology and information that the development's able to happen um, And then as the development happens then there's more people who can contribute um, And come up with new ideas and can you know, work on the you know more more engineers and more startups and more new you know more new thinking um, And so it's like development technology development technology kind of are mm -hmm. in this in this uh, sort of uh, sort of virtuous cycle um, and so it's a world we've never lived in, right? It's, it, we, we've yeah. always lived in a world in which there are some people who can contribute and connect um, and be full participants, and then there are a lot of people who just can't. Right. Um, and to be in a world where everybody uh, can connect and contribute is probably the biggest thing that's ever happened. Yeah. Yeah, people always talk, and I heard this all the time when I was traveling through emerging markets, people would say, well, there's not new ideas that are going to come out of those places because they're 30 years behind us. And it's like, right. it's not all linear. They're not going to now go yeah. into, like, rotary phones and right. then, you know, I mean, it, it develops differently. There's a great story. Well, there's a great, the, the great analogy on this is, um, this is, and I don't want to pick on, I can, I can allow myself to pick on companies that have gone bankrupt. Um, that's my, <laughs> that's my Mark 2.0 rule. Um, so Kodak, Mark 1.0 would have picked on would anyone. Would have picked on anybody. Uh, so Kodak's last ditch attempt to stay in business was literally the bet that um, although uh, photography in the developed world was going to go digital, that people in the developing world were still going to use film analog film. <laughs> um, and so they built like a huge number of a huge amount of uh, film, analog film manufacturing capacity, in particular in China, under the assumption that a thousand, uh, a million Chinese people, uh, a bill, sorry, a billion Chinese people were going to buy. Would not have phones. Flash analog <laughs> cameras. And then they would presumably take the film to the Walgreens down the street that did not exist <laughs> um, to get it. Anyway, Fast forward, everybody in China gets a cell phone with a camera, boom, doesn't work, Kodak, boom, bankrupt. Um, that's not just Kodak, though. That is a mentality that we, tend, we do tend to, in the West, we tend to apply. We, we tend to just, we tend to, we had to go through the evolution, and so we tend to assume everybody else does. That's not, it's, a, it's an instantaneous leapfrog. Right. Um, and then there's that. And then there's all the, just the new thinking and new ideas that come out of different environments and, you know, people who have, have, have kind of come up differently. 
And then there's the kicker, right, which is we have no idea how many Mozarts or Einsteins, right, or, you know, Larry Pages there are in the world. Like, we, we, don't, we don't know. Mm -hmm. The best guess would be they're evenly distributed, right? Um, and so take however many we have today out of, you know, the small number of hundreds of millions of people who can get kind of what we would consider to be a, a, a state-of-the-art education and apply that, extrapolate that up by a factor of, you know, 20. Mm -hmm. uh, or 30, like, we're guaranteed to get a lot more geniuses out of this. Um, and that's the part, right? And you never know who's going to be the genius that's going to change everything. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, and the tragedy to it is we'll never know how many of those people were born and were never able to fulfill, uh, you know, their potential. But now we're going to be able to find out for the mm -hmm. first time. When you think there's going to be, like, really huge changes in just what all of these people being online and all these people mobile p people being connected via mobile does like there's going to be more countries old yeah. boundaries are going to blow up i mean on a repeated basis yeah so there's this really fascinating video online of a map of the world and then it's sort of a time frame with that's basic correlation spread of the internet so basically from 1990 to to today, and it basically it shows you the map of people on the internet, and then it shows you sort of graphically the, the rate of political protests in the world. And it starts, you know, with like, you know, a little protest here and there, and the internet's climbing up, and of course, within the last five years, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just constant protest everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we kind of just have gotten used to it, like that political protests are escalating everywhere, but like it's a huge increase uh, mm -hmm. in political protests. Well, activity. I think we wonder sometimes, are we just seeing it? Yeah, or is it getting reported you know, more? And it's yeah. like, no, it's like, it's happening. Like, it's, it's, it, it, it really is happening. It's really accelerated. Um, so political protesting is way up, um, and I think will continue to grow. And then number of countries um, is up by, I think, 30 in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. There are 30 new countries, and I think that number is going to explode. Um, I think there's going to be double, triple, quadruple the number of countries in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Like, I think it's just going to go. It's really going to expand because you've got, I mean, there's this sort of long topic, but... A lot of countries in the world where, like, nobody living there ever thought that that country was a good idea, right? Um, <laughs> like, the Middle East, the Middle East, like, the boundaries in the Middle East were drawn by the Brits and the French and the Americans, mm -hmm. like, after World War I. Like, Syria is an artificial construct. Iraq is an artificial construct. Like, most of Africa. Most of Africa. Like, nobody asked, like, the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds, boy, would it be a good idea to draw a big box, <laughs> you know, around all you guys. And so... You know, and, and, and this is sort of the thing in these politics, you know, the, then the strong man can hold it together for some period of time, you know, in the Cold War, whatever, whatever. At a certain point, people are going to assert themselves. And by the way, if you give them the tools by which they can organize, um, they're, going, they're going to do it. Um, and then they're going to ultimately vote. Mm -hmm. Like, one way or another, they're going to vote. Like, either, you know, unfortunately, violently or nonviolently. They're going to vote, but this is also happening in the in the in the developed world. Like this is happening in the UK. Mm -hmm. This is going to be happening increasingly, I think, in Europe. Um, you know, I have no idea what happens in the US, but you know, in the fullness of time, you know, who knows? Um, and it's going to happen all throughout the developing world. And so you're going to get a much larger number of countries. Um, and I think it's going to. I mean, the transition is going to be very painful, um, but I think ultimately it's going to be very healthy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, coming out the other end, 100 years from now, it'll be very healthy because you'll have people who have chosen to ally themselves. Um, you know, with their neighbors and form states and form nations um, and work together and collaborate. Like, I think that's ultimately the answer as opposed to, you know, we drew the box for you 80 years ago, live with it. Right. Um, and it's these technologies, right, notwithstanding what Malcolm Gladwell says, like, it is these technologies that are going to make that possible. Mm -hmm. You know, these things, these things are going to get organized on social networks and these things are going to, you know, the president of Turkey says that Twitter is the most insidious and evil um, uh, corrupting force on civil society in the history of mankind. Uh, which is really funny because in the Valley, it's constant criticism of Twitter is just for like 14 year old girls to tweet with their cat head for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, Peter Thiel doesn't think it's done enough. <laughs> right, exactly, right. And so somewhere between that and, you know, somewhere between that and, you know, the cat and, 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 and the president of Turkey, you know, you know <laughs> absolutely hating it. Um, and I think he's more, like, I think it's, I mean, he's not, I don't think he's literally right, but I mean, I think there's, mm -hmm. the underlying point is it, it, you give people communication tools. One of my favorite books, can we stay on this? I love this topic. So one of my favorite books um, is called Orwell's Revenge, and it came out about 20 years ago. Um, and it's a rewrite of the book 1984. And so it, it starts in 1984 and the, the view screens and you know, the big brother and the whole thing. And then about halfway through the book, he kind of does this twist. Um, and he adds one kind of attribute to it, which is he makes the view screens that everybody has in all their homes uh, two way. Mm -hmm. Right, and so all of a sudden everybody can broadcast and write. Of course, by the end of the book, there's been political revolution, right? Democracy, like you know, it's. Mm -hmm. And so when you give people the ability to learn and express themselves and organize, you know, you're going to get that's that's going to change a lot. And that the, the smartphone is clearly the enabler for that all over the world. And I mm -hmm. think it's I think it's I think it's great. Mm -hmm. um, we do. 
unlike many Panda Monthlies, have a limit to your time tonight. So I, I want to go to questions of the audience soon. Sure. But before we do, I want to get back a little bit to your story. Um, you know, I don't want to get too into Opsware because I think Ben like exercised demons and talked about it for an hour or so with us. Um, but you know, you guys had a very bruising experience as a public company. Mm -hmm. After coming out about Opsware, that ending very successfully, yeah. did, did it make you feel like you didn't want to do another company? Is that, did that play into wanting to do a venture firm instead? Yeah, at some, po you know, at some point, we, we met, when we first started, um, when we first started, uh, when we first started our firm, we went up and met with Jeff, we met with a bunch of people we really respect, we met with Jeff Bezos, and, um, and, uh, and you know, he's, we were pitching him on, on, on the thing, and he said, you know, well, why, are you, why don't you guys go start another company? And, and uh, Ben said, well, you know, Jeff, you know, if Amazon were to sell or whatever, you know, would you start another company? And he said, of course not. Um, <laughs> and he looked at us and he said, you know, that would be like going back to kindergarten. And he's like, I really, really enjoyed kindergarten, but I don't want to do it again. <laughs> um, and we said, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so at a certain point, I think it just, you know, it's, I also, my other favorite line on this is Sean Parker, um, you know, said uh, doing a startup is like a chewing glass. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, you just start to like the taste of your own blood. <laughs> um, and so, at a certain point, um, it's, it's, you know, some, some people are just ready for a break. Some people go do other things. Um, in our case, it felt like it was time to, to mm -hmm. take it in, in this direction. Of course, Andreessen Horowitz has been treated like a company. I mean, you guys yeah. did not take the traditional model. A lot's been written about the model that you guys did. And you guys have pissed a lot of people off. I mean, I hear more shit talking about Andreessen Horowitz than any other firm, which is either a compliment or an insult. From who? Well, other VCs, naturally. From who? From, from, say that louder. Say that louder. From other VCs. Really? Interesting. How about that? Interesting. But you have, whether Gee, people... So it, it would not have occurred to me that our, 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 our partners and competitors would have that amount of spare time <laughs> to be able to get on the phone with you and say things like that. I can't, I, 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 I can't, I can't, they, they must not have much going on. I, I, you know, I, interesting, interesting, interesting. Sorry, you, please, whether please people love you or hate you, Every, you have hijacked the conversation in the venture world, and you see a lot of people trying to adapt to your model. A lot of people complain that you have forever eroded the comfortable margins of venture capital because you can no longer have five people sharing. Oh, <laughs> look at the look that on is your so face. sad. <laughs> I feel terrible. <laughs> Does this How will they afford their third vineyard? <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say when you hear about this? Because if I hear about it, you hear about it. I, you know, it's just, it, so the, the, reality of the, venture, the reality of venture business is we partner with everybody, right? So mm -hmm. we, we're, we're co-investors. That's why they say it quietly to yeah, me. Yeah, they say it very you. quietly. <laughs> and they say it, they say it, they say it on, on background, off the record. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's like we're, 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 we're competitors. Um, uh, we're competitors. We think that uh, markets, uh, industry should be competitive. We like competing. Um, the reality of the venture business, venture business is a little bit odd. It, it's just, we're used to, we're, we have to, we have to, I will say, we have to hold ourselves back. Like, we're, we're this is the deeply restrained version um, of our competitive I instincts. wish I'd seen Mark 1.0 doing yeah. Andreessen Horowitz, because you would have been oh, apeshit. It would have been so much more extreme. Um, <laughs> but the reality of the venture business is you, you partner around the companies. Um, and so there's almost no case where a great company got built by one venture firm. It's almost always in cooperation uh, with other firms. And it's, the, it's this phenomenon where you, you build syndicates. Uh, around the companies, and so we're almost always for any successful company we have, we're almost always doing it with you know, and you know the you know the names, the the the, the other venture capital firms, um, and the partnerships work really well. Like it's it's works really well. We're you know good friend, you know we very happy. You know, it's funny business. You know you're very ha you're board meeting, you're working together, you're collaborating, you're talking, and then you know six hours later you're head to head for a Series A and you're punching each other in the nose. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's the it's the f fabled coopetition. Um, that is very rare in business, but actually is the case. And so I, 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 say, I, I, I say the counter to what you're saying is that we pride ourselves on the range of the other firms that we partner with. And I think what they would, the question to ask, I think, about us to both the entrepreneurs and to the other VCs is, you know, how helpful are we? Mm -hmm. How productive is it to have us involved? How much do we add, you know, mm -hmm. to the situation? And I think they would all pretty much say good things. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, I want to open it up some questions. So I know a lot of people got online and got tickets very quickly. And hopefully you can hang out just a bit. Uh, I think, are we, are we doing a line, Ani? Yeah, um, so, uh, I'm sorry, just, yeah, line up behind JD, and we'll get to as many as we can. And ask really quickly, and let Mark answer really quickly, so we can get through as many as possible. Okay, hey, Sarah Kuda. Uh, <laughs> hi, Mark. Uh, JD Laska, 
Um, so I watch um, Shark Tank every week, uh, my guilty pleasure, and one of the things you see almost every single week is somebody saying, um, love your idea, love your business plan, but it's not for me, it's not my kind of kind of thing. How much do you have to have like a personal passion for the investments that you make? You know, I mean, if you never step into a car, would you invest in Lyft, even if it's gonna change the world? Yeah, so this is sort of the, so I, I, I said, you know, one big issue of venture capital is the conflict policy, which is when we invest in one company, we're not gonna invest in the rest in the category. And the problem with that is you don't know the ones that don't exist yet, right? And so it may, you know, the investors in MySpace, right, all wish that they had waited for Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, no, I mean, they did, they did fine at MySpace, but, but, but you know, there, there was another one that was gonna come along. Um, so, uh, so that's one issue. The other issue is there's just a, there's a limitation on how many boards a, a, a partner in a venture firm can go on. And so, and it, we think it's like 10 to 12 is the max. Um, and more than that, and you stop being useful to the companies because you're not available when they, when they need you. Um, and so, and then you have to assume when you invest that you're in the partnership for 10 years. Um, you have to assume that it, it, it's, it's literally like having a ticket with, you know, 10 punches. Um, and you get 10 years per punch before you can put something else in that slot. Um, and so that's the challenge of the whole thing is this partner with an open slot, right, where he's pas he or she is pas passionate enough about that category um, to be able to fill that slot and block out every other deal they could do for the next 10 years, who also is not already conflicted, who is also willing to take on the conflict, right, who also thinks that this is a great entrepreneur, who also thinks that this is a good price, right? And so the, the internal chain, it's like seven or eight or nine hurdles that have to be jumped. Um, and most of those are out of control of the entrepreneur. Um, and they're just, they're, they just are what they are. Um, the recommendation on how to deal with that is it really helps if you have an angel investor involved or an advisor and you know, somebody like Ron Conway or, or you know, like several other people in the Valley kind of do this really well who really understands the VCs um, because it's really helpful to be able to know ahead of time, yeah, this person has openings, this person's really interested, mm -hmm. you know, whereas this other person's conflicted, because they can be really, it'd be very hard to tell from the outside, and it's very helpful to get somebody to help navigate you through that. Mm -hmm. like, and like I said, most of it has nothing to do with the entrepreneur, so it's just helpful to, to, to know going into it. Hi, Dan Mark, good to see you again. Uh, Kareem Khan, Latinum Fund. Do you think that data, pre-selling and pre-funding, and what's gonna end up being a marketplace for funding of startups like commodities are gonna fill the hole for the great companies that don't wanna wait for the right investors or advisors and just wanna take the market. Yeah. Do you see that happening with the data around that? And what's your vision for what you're doing with Angels List? So I can't actually hear that well because the speakers could, are pointed out. Yeah, I could. And I, there's no monitors. Out. And so I'm going to attempt to answer the questions. Um, hopefully I answer the questions that are being asked and not other questions entirely. <laughs> um, so, crowdfunding, crowdfunding, right? Yeah, for startups. Um, so, incredibly exciting. So, crowdfunding is an incredibly exciting thing that's going on right now. Uh, Kickstarter has been, you know, a revolutionary company. CrowdTilt is one of our companies that's applying that idea, you know, very broadly. It's doing very well. Um, and then now AngelList and this sort of opening up of crowdfunding platforms for companies is, and I think it is an extraordinarily positive thing. I mean, so much of how the stock market has worked for the last 20 years is to try to protect investors against themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I, you know, I think at some level people ought to be able to invest in the things they want to invest in, and I think it's great that there are more options for startups, and I think there's great that there's more options for um, investors. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, opportunity. Um, we, um, are, we are very much benefiting, we as a venture capital firm are very much benefiting today from the people raising money to build their products. Um, because first of all, they usually also need additional financing. Um, right. It's usually not just enough to raise money like on Kickstarter to build a product if you're gonna build a company. Um, and then of course, if you can sell out, you know, s several million dollars worth of a product that doesn't exist yet on Kickstarter, that validates demand. Right. That's, you know, and plus it's money, um, and, and that's great. And they don't great. give up equity. And they don't give up equity, so it's fantastic. Um, you know, the long-term question is gonna be what's the right way for different kinds of companies to get funded, either with like a traditional venture capital or angel route or with a, a, a crowdfunding uh, approach. Um, I can argue both sides of that. I mean, I think it's gonna be somewhere, I think it's gonna be a mix, I think it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, there's a risk, as I like to say, there's a risk that we're like the most evolved dinosaur, um, <laughs> right, and that the crowdfunding platforms are the birds, right, and we're the dinosaurs, we're T-Rex, and we're looking up at the birds and we're laughing, right, and then the meteor is coming straight at us. Um, so there's, there's, you know, you can paint sort of these sort of utopian scenarios where there's like a complete replacement and everything is crowdfunded. You know, the counter example to that is, you know, it's, it's, it's the, 
for especially for young private companies where not much exists yet, what, like, for investors to invest in public stocks, like, you've got SEC filings, you've got reams of data, you've got tons of analysis. Uh, for a startup that doesn't exist yet, you know, you've, you've got, a, you, good news, you've got a dream and you've got some people. Um, the crowd to be able to invest in those things, be able to pick the right ones, to be able to support them the right way, be able to finance them enough, be able to tie them into the network, you know, maybe in some cases, or maybe a combination of the two. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, I think that the fraud problem is going to be a very, the fraud and loss problem is going to be a very big problem. I, so my best guess is there will be a wave of fraud and loss that will be profound. I, it's just such, I mean, you already see this. It's just something that all the crowdfunding platforms are battling is, 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 is fraudulent offers, mm -hmm. uh, fraudulent uh, fundraisers. Um, and so the really negative outcome would be a wave of fraud and abuse or just flat out money loss. And then the SEC moves in or the FTC moves in and like regulates the whole thing or puts it out of business. And so I think it would be a good idea to not move too quickly and to be fairly prudent in how these platforms are built out. Mm -hmm. um, I think Naval's being extremely responsible um, about it. I think you know, uh, Kickstarter's been working very hard on this. Mm -hmm. So I think the big players are, are doing the right things. Um, but um, I, I, would, I would temper the excitement a little bit with the risk. And then of course the downside risk is if it just turns out, to, if the first three years are a story of fraud and abuse and loss, then the whole thing will get shut down. It'll be another 10 years before people try it again. Right. And so this, this one just bears watching and bears, I think, prudence and moderation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Hi, Mark. I'm Denise Terry. I wanted to ask you if you could comment on AngelList and the disruption of venture capital as a result of syndicates and the change in general solicitation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I basically already, already did. Um, I, so I've been an investor in AngelList from the start, um, mm -hmm. back when it was Venture Hacks. <laughs> um, and so um, I've always been a fan. Um, the ideas make total sense. It's great to see it. You know, Naval, privately, Naval's been talking about this for quite a while. Uh, you know, he had to get through things like, yeah, Naval's a great example. He runs up right against regulation, and his answer is literally he goes on a plane and gets a new law passed um, <laughs> with the Jobs Act, which is an incredibly impressive achievement. Um, like an incredibly impressive achievement. Um, and so he's been extremely uh, smart and extremely wise and extremely um, um, sort of thoughtful in how he's gone about doing it. The idea is tremendously exciting. It makes, you know, it, it, it makes total sense. Um, and then we'll just, we'll have to see how it balances out in terms of, you know, at some, po at some point you get into practical questions of the companies that get funded with crowdsourcing uh, into equity. How many of them are gonna make people money and how many of them are gonna lose people money and in what proportions and which investors and, and kind of all, you know, sort of all these kind of real questions. Just, just like the same question you had in the 90s with IPOs, mm -hmm. right? There are times when it's a good idea to invest in IPOs, there are times when it's a very bad idea to invest in IPOs. And so it's just, it's, it's because these things can become frenzies and bubbles, uh, you know, just, I just wanna be a little cautious before saying, you know, no brainer up into the right, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the, the really smart entrepreneurs thinking about this stuff are proceeding judiciously because I think that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, great. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, your firm recently brought in Michael Copeland from Wired to uh, create content uh, under your name. Can you talk a little bit about what you're thinking in content creation and why you made a bet like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, thr well, we're thrilled to have Michael. Um, uh, so we hired Michael, and then uh, Sequoia has hired um, like Ben. A, ben. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's, a bunch, uh, there's a bunch of other searches underway. Uh, we, know, we, we know that. Um, so I think, I mean, the, the, the macro idea is we've, we've historically done this through our blogging. We're, we, we've been trying to be as transparent as possible, and in particular, the big thing we've been trying to do as a firm, kind of from the beginning, is we've been trying to fully articulate how we think about the world, and we've been trying to fully articulate kind of what we're like to work with. Mm -hmm. it, Ben's blog has been kind of the best, you know, the best, you know, I, I did some stuff before, and then Ben has been blogging extensively for the last four years, and if you read Ben's blog um, kind of front to back, you basically already know Ben by the time you sit down with him. Yeah. Like, you know how he thinks, and so if you're an entrepreneur especially, you know how he thinks about companies, you know how he thinks about stages, you know how he thinks about all kinds of things. And so what we found is it gives entrepreneurs especially a great deal of comfort to already understand us before they walk in the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so hiring Michael, and we've been doing that, I mean, and it's been amateur hour because it's a little bit us at our keyboard, you know, at midnight with a glass of scotch, blogging. Um, and so Michael, uh, among other things, is going to help us kind of up-level that, professionalize that, you know, be, you know, wittier and more articulate um, and more comprehensive. We'll really broaden that approach out. Um, and it's, it's it put it almost entirely in the category of trying to explain um, so that people are prepared or educated or that we're just being more transparent. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Edward Teller, and uh, I wanted to ask about hardware, but at the grassroots, at the small level, rather than Hyperloop, uh, self uh, Google driving cars, and so forth, MakerBot, uh, uh, and Arduino, which is now Intel, is, and uh, uh, Timex is uh, 
has a one gigabyte version that's going to come out. Uh, what do you s are you looking at that, and what do you see happening in that area, and do you see anything related to robotics in that at, at grassroots level developing and, and funding? Right, and hardware, right? Hardware, yeah, hardware. hardware. Yeah, so hardware. So there's a new there's a new hardware entrepreneurial boom. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So the way I think about it is. Um, Venture capital, hardware was what Silicon Valley did <laughs> at one point, right? So <laughs> silicon Part was of hardware. Silicon. <laughs> silicon was hardware, um, and then computers, right, were hardware. And so, you know, Kleiner Perkins' first fund, one of its big winners was Tandem, which mm -hmm. was a computer company. Um, you know, Compaq was a big venture capital win. Um, SGI was a big hardware company, big venture capital win. Sun. So the Valley historic Cisco. So the Valley historically has been very good at making new hardware, computer hardware companies of various kinds. Um, at a certain point, that kind of stopped. I mean, not entirely, but but for about the last you know ten or fifteen years, that kind of went yeah. out of style. Did you say software ate it. And software ate it, right? Exactly. <laughs> and so, um, and and really, what happened was a couple things happened. One is hardware. The hardware categories that worked just got very capital intensive. And so, to build a new semiconductor plant or a new computer factory, it started to cost a lot of money. Again, more than venture capital could afford. And so, the big companies, Intel, started to become much more important, and Samsung and companies like that. Um, and then, um, and then, and then you could apply software. Um, and then, and then, basically, I think what's happened: two things have happened in the last, basically, 15 years. Uh, well, three things. One is just not much hardware innovation has happened because there haven't been hardware startups. Um, and so there's like a, bottle, a lot of bottled up ideas like drones and robots that just did not get developed in the last 15 years. So there's, and you see this whenever there's like a missing gap of time where there's no innovation in a category. At some point, it's like it's spring loaded. Yeah. And it just comes back. It comes roaring back. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's happening. So that's happening. Two is the hardware has the, 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 the prefab components are now way more sophisticated than they used to be. So you buy a chip from TI or, or, or uh, Samsung, and it's just like it's a miracle of a machine of what's on that chip. Um, and it's got graphics and video and like all this stuff. And so there's so much more you can do with off the shelf components. And then the new software. It, these chips are not powerful enough to run real software. Um, and so a drone or a robot or a toy can now run a real operating system and real applications. And by real, I mean like you know, Linux or, or you know, Android or something where you can really run like serious applications. Um, and so what we're seeing right now are, I mean, number one, hard, people have worked in hardware in the past now thinking about you know, starting companies or inventing new products again. The other is we're seeing university graduates come out that are actually, we're seeing some of the best are sort of triple threats where they're mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science. And, they, they, and so they understand mechanical, electrical, and computers, they understand it all. And so they sit down to like build a drone or build a robot and like they can build the entire thing themselves. Um, <laughs> and they're amazing. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, Airware is one of our investments. We've got Jonathan Downey who's like this uh, in drones. He's, he's just, he understands the entire thing. Um, and so the ideas are popping, right? And now you're seeing hardware incub you know, so incubators, you know, that have la you know, basically labs, you know, and shop floors for you prototyping hardware. And there's hardware-specific investors. And um, the uh, chairman of uh, uh, Mail.ru uh, came over and visited us a month ago, and he's got a venture fund in Russia devoted to literally robots, literally robotics. <laughs> and he's incredibly fired up. So like th this, this stuff is happening. Um, the problem um, is that uh, hardware companies are much harder to build and scale um, than software companies. Even with Kickstarter, even, even with, with Kickstarter, China, even, even with China, um, there are so many more things that can go wrong in a hardware company. Yeah. There's so many more ways a hardware company can blow up in a non-recoverable way. Mm -hmm. um, and I could go on for hours about this. Um, and so, and part of the challenge right now is a lot of the new, especially the new kids coming into hardware, coming into hardware, coming out of school, they've never worked. In, like it's been so long since people have worked in hardware companies. Like, or they've never, or they, or they were, you know, and then the, the culture has lost a lot of the hardware knowledge. And so, mm -hmm. what we always tell that 22-year-old who wants to start, you know, like a drone company, is you got to go get somebody who's like 50 who worked at like National Semiconductor, who's like just a hardcore, hard-bitten, angry like ops guy, <laughs> you know, who's just like used to yelling at vendors and like, you know, uh -huh. just like working, you know, FedEx on shipping costs and all the really nitty-gritty stuff uh, to make this work. And I, I think if you can build these companies around sort of the experience of the old, of the sort of prior generation of hardware with all the new ideas, uh, it's very powerful. Um, mm -hmm. but the problems are real. Like they're very, Chris Dixon and I argue about this in the office all the time. He says, hardware's new software. And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Hardware's the new hardware. <laughs> like it is hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's called hardware for a reason, but we're excited. All right, great. We've got two more questions. Hi, Mark. Um, Paul Sass. Um, this is informed by watching Larry Page's transformation. I'm, you're incredibly successful, brilliant, wealthy. Did you ever aspire to be beautiful? 
Did I ever what? so rude. <laughs> I have a feeling I just missed a very important question. You didn't. I didn't? Okay. No, All let's right. move on. Okay. <laughs> Hey Mark, uh, Devin Road here. Um, so GitHub has a very uh, radical company model. They basically have no managers, um, and a ton of their code is freely available open source. Uh, do you think um, this will permeate through, permeate through the tech industry and companies will start adopting the same model? What was the I company? I totally missed I'm that. Sorry, which what was company? the company, I'm sorry? GitHub. GitHub, 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 GitHub. yeah. You love them. GitHub, we love GitHub. I can't wait, I love talking about GitHub. Um, so, and uh, actually, without the mic, just yell the question again, because I'll be able to hear it better. No, without the mic, not with yeah, the mic. Yeah, just yell it. Because we, we, we can't can hear, hear through the speakers. Yeah, so uh, GitHub, like, they have basically no managers. Um, oh. So it's free open source. Yeah. There's structure. Um, other companies Yeah, so I differentiate between the two things you just said. So no managers versus open source. Um, so the no managers thing, um, uh, it... <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble. I think your face says it all. I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> so they are extremely focused on having a high productivity culture. Um, they are extremely focused on being a place where the individual programmer can make a fundamental contribution in the company. Um, and they're extremely uh, focused on making sure that that remains the case as, as they scale. Um, and they are very determined to have, and we're like, we love that. Like it's, it's like the impact that pro individual, individuals have at GitHub, you know, is just, is, is, is profound. Um, they over time will have to evolve ways of organizing, you know, as you go from, you know, they're, they're growing very fast now. And so um, I wouldn't overtrain as much on the no manager's part as the focus on productivity, the focus on individual contribution. And I think that they're very, they're very good on that stuff, and I think they, they always will be. Um, on the open source side, they're a great example of a company. I mean, so this is sort of the, it's actually sort of irony of how the industry works. So once upon a time, you know, grandchildren, um, <laughs> uh, people paid for software. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, open source arrived and other things arrived um, and uh, people stopped paying for software. And I mean, it makes certain things so ironic. Like, you know, there was software piracy was such a huge issue in the 80s and 90s. And there were huge lobbying campaigns and legal prosecutions to keep people from stealing software. Um, and, you know, and then, and then at, you know, the app stores, you know, the Apple and Google app stores, like if you can charge for software in the app store, it's like you can charge 99 cents. Um, and increasingly, you can't even charge that. Um, and so you could imagine living in a world in which like, there's just a lot less software developed because it's, you know, nobody's going to be able to make any money at it. And just as that looked like it was about to become a danger, the cloud software as a service model arrived. Mm -hmm. right? And Salesforce.com took off, and Workday took off, and Box.net took off, and mm -hmm. GitHub took off. Um, and, and, and then you know, on the consumer side, right, you know, sort of same thing, Facebook and Google and so forth. Um, uh, and all of a sudden, you have the online service as kind of the model of the software company of, of the future. And the great thing about those models, a bunch of great things, but you know, much easier for users to use than trying to download and install a piece of software. Um, much better business model, because you can charge by the month, which is mm -hmm. much better than charging one time. Um, and then um, the, 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 the piece de resistance, it can't be pirated. Mm -hmm. um, it's a running system. Um, like even if you could download all the code, you still could never figure out how to tilt one of those things up on your own. Like it, you know, <laughs> it would be inco incomprehensible from the outside. Um, and so, you know, the idea of commercial software is not dead. And there are categories where there is still software that makes a lot of money, and there will still be categories like that. But there are certainly more and more categories that are open source, and then there are certainly more and more categories that are SaaS. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, at, at least open source and SaaS are developing the, at, at sort of the exact same time. They feed on each other. Right. Um, the more open source there is, the easier it is to create new SaaS, new SaaS applications. And then GitHub is kind of in the center of the whole thing because they're built on open source, but they're SaaS, but they also host a lot of the open source, but they also let people build new proprietary software using all the open source. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of right in the middle of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Hence why you invested exactly, a shitload yes. of money in them. Well, it's, 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 a, um, it's a network. Like, it's a network. It, it's almost a, uh, they probably won't like this, it's, it's, like, it's almost like a social network for code. Yeah. Right? It's like a, it's like a you know, it's, it's like the best part of our, of, of our world, right, is it's what if you could have all the code online, and what if you could have all the code in one place, and what if all the code knew about all the other code, and what if mm -hmm. all the programmers knew about all the other programmers? Like, that would be amazing. Like, right. programmers would be way more productive. You'd be able to get a lot more done, and that's what GitHub is doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so there are two final questions. Okay. Are you right. a very good PR people, so I'm sure you've been prepped about this. But I actually have one before that one, no. um, before those two. Um, so I, you've lived in Silicon Valley um, a long time. You've experienced a lot of different waves. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned in an earlier 
part of the, the evening, you know, you were you know, both like a hero and then you were vilified and now you're a hero again. Do you, there's a lot of people who feel like Silicon Valley is nastier now than it's been in a long time. That there's more of a sense it's a zero sum game. People fight more, people throw each other under the bus more. I'm not convinced that's true, but I'm curious what you think. I think it's true in the, pre in the press. I think it's mm -hmm. true in the press and the blogs. Um, and I mean, the blogging, the blogging revolution has been amazing for tech and that so much more is covered. I mean, Ben told the story. Computer reseller news, I like to think of, was the Pando Daily of its time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just didn't have money to invest in them. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> we fulfilled that fantasy. Well, and they used to be able to sell paper copies, um, which <laughs> grandchildren. Slightly better business In the model. old days, people used to be able to do that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the, the great thing about, you know, obviously Pando, but all the other tech blogs, including the, the businesses and then all, all the independent bloggers, is tech is so much better covered now than it ever was before. I mean, it's just phenomenal um, how much it's being covered and how well it's being covered. You know, the bad news is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a battle, um, especially it's a battle online. Uh, and so there is kind of a nasty tinge to some of the online stuff. Um, I think, I don't know, I view, I guess I have two answers. One is, I think, I think it's amazing in the Valley. It always has been how incredibly important it is to entrepreneurs to help each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the dominant theme among entrepreneurs is they help each other, and we see that every day. Um, and then I think that even beyond the entrepreneurial community, the number of people who are executives of big companies or investors or advisors or retired yeah. CEOs or whatever who will go out of their way to help people. Yeah. You know, the pay it forward and culture. frequently people they don't know. Yeah, frequently yeah. people they don't know. And so that, that's alive and well. And I would put that up against, I always uh, you know, if, if, you know, friends in LA in the entertainment business, and I mean, that is a brass knuckled knife fight to the death. Like, those guys like go at each other. Um, you know, it's like they don't even bother stabbing, them, stabbing each other in the back. They just stab each other right in the chest. Um, <laughs> And like that's, they'll, they'll all tell you that's a zero-sum game, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and the reason is there's only a certain number of movies that are getting made, there's only a certain yeah. number of TV shows that are getting made, and like, you know, for my movie to get made, your movie can't get made. Right. Um, and in our industry, it's not like that. It's completely limited by the number of new ideas and the number of people, um, and, they can, and, and, and they, can all, they can all succeed. They can all, all the new ideas and all the new people can succeed. Um, uh, you know, and, and so um, it's just such a, the, the, when people come from LA and they come up here, they're just stunned at how positive everybody is. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that remains the case. Okay, great. What is the one thing that you believe that no one or very few people believe? I think that um, the decline and fall of the United States um, is uh, completely overblown. Um, mm -hmm. I think the 21st century will be another American century. Mm -hmm. um, I think, as I said, I think that the growth and development of the world is the biggest story of our time. Um, but we in the United States are so well set up um, to be a major enabling force for that um, and to be able to build the best companies in the world that are able to provide new kinds of products and services into those markets. Um, and you know, we are the place that everybody in the world wants to send their kids to get educated. Um, uh, like I think there's a, the idea that there's this like China versus US battle, right, that's gonna play out and it's like some sort of zero sum game is just false. Um, and I think China is gonna do fantastically well, but I think the US is gonna do phenomenally well. And I think the US is gonna exit the century um, you know, more, you know, more powerful and more amazing than it's, than it's ever been. We could, of course, completely screw that up. You know, it is an option. Mm -hmm. You know, sitting here on day three of the government shutdown. <laughs> um, you know, um, but it, it's almost like what I always tell startups: like you're almost always self. It's just with countries. I think it's the same thing as with companies. It feels like you're competing. You're almost always self-limited. Um, yeah. You're almost always limited in what you can do. Mm -hmm. It's almost always the stuff that's under your control. That's that's the stuff that's going to either you know you know it's, it's the stuff that's going to kill you is the stuff that you're going to screw up that you didn't have to screw up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's generally better to look inward um, uh, and to say how can we make you know this country a better place as opposed to worrying about threats. Uh, and and so and I think if we do that, you know, and there's a lot of teeth gnashing and a lot of you know you know there's a lot of a lot of what I call right now decline porn. Like there's all these <laughs> books, decline and fall of the United States and Niall Ferguson and Tom Friedman and it's just kind of on and on. And it's like, okay, fine, I get it, I get it. We got problems, we got education, we got healthcare, we got all these problems. But like, I, th I think they're all fixable mm -hmm. over a long enough time frame with enough effort. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our, if, if we channel enough effort into doing right. the right things, we'll do really, really well. One thing I discovered traveling in the emerging world is like, oh wow, China, you're amazing. And you, like, you get to a lot of these countries and like, they would be happy to trade their problems for our problems. Oh yeah, no question. China would trade in a heartbeat. India would trade in a heartbeat. 
Yeah. And we just, and it's just, I don't know, it's this, it's this, it's this natural phenomenon. It's like, it's like the grass is always browner or something, right? It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, or the grass is always greener, I guess. Yeah, um, our grass just, is browner. Our grass is browner. Right, it's, yeah, so, yeah. And, and so, um, and I just, it's just not, it's just not true. Mm -hmm. It's just not true. Now, which doesn't mean we don't have our problems, but like, I think we can deal with them. And, Mark Andreessen, if you could have one mediocre superpower, what would it be? Mediocre superpower. Mm -hmm. I've thought long and hard about this one. <laughs> You actually watch these, unlike a lot of people who come, because I, do. I will get done with one and I, I will get like 15 yeah. emails from you as you are continuing to watch yeah. it. And I, pre I presume yeah. get drunker and drunker. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. I like to think of them as notes, you know, feedback. Hel helpful, helpful, helpful constructive feedback. Um, I would like the superpower, the mediocre superpower of being able to go to the bathroom during a business meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, wi to which you might say, I could probably figure out a way of doing that today. Yes. To which I respond, bags. that's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, the irony in this is Amanda Schwab, who first came up with this as a question, uh -huh. the first time she asked it, I said, oh, that's easy. Like, urine would just evaporate from my bladder because I was pregnant at the time. So oh, you think like a pregnant woman. Apparently, I might be pregnant. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, so, uh, once again, huge thanks to Trinet for sponsoring. I think this is like the billionth one they've sponsored, and we hope that you all pay them money so that they continue to sponsor them. And we tell and we all of our startups, them. in all seriousness, we tell all of our startups to use Trinet. Do you? So that's easy. Yes. Why? Why is trying to? By the way, that just doubled the rate for tonight. I know. Check is yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I was gonna say check but is that's in the mail. True. That's, that's there. true. That's totally Bill true. Bill is in the mail. That's totally um, true. They're better than others or cheaper? Oh, it's just they're the. I mean, I think they're the. They're the ones everyone use. They're the. They're very very good. Hmm. Yeah. Good. That's an endorsement money can't buy. There except I'm invoicing you. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, we only have one more Panda Monthly of the year. Do you know who it is? Nope. Dick Costello. Fantastic. In December, fresh off an oh, IPO. He'll be out. He'll be unmuzzled. He hasn't good. canceled yet. Yeah, good, good. S1 came out today. What do you think? Yes, I think it's fantastic. I'm in, enormously conflicted in every <laughs> conceivable way, but I think it's great. So we've got Dick Costello here. We have Henry Blodgett yeah. as our last New York guest. Um, and then we've got uh, Mark Suster and Jason Calacanis down in LA. So either watch or join this for all of them. And this has been one of the ones I've been looking forward to the most over the time I've run the company. So huge thanks to Mark Andreessen. Good, good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.